Now what we might move to the ergonomics basics for kids at home and school um, with a Melissa Statham and Andrew Flanagan. So I'm going to now hand you over to uh, Melissa and Andrew. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Melissa, ergonomist at the Windsor Clinic, and today uh, with uh, Andrew, my colleague, we're going to be presenting on the ergonomic basics for kids at home and at school. So just to provide some brief background on how technology has influenced education throughout the years. In 1999 was when the first SchoolNet program was established and that connected over 16,000 students to the internet. When you, you know, jump forward to 2014 in Ontario, we saw that access to computers um, was about at 80% and starting as young as kindergarten is when we saw these being integrated into the classroom. Looking into 2019 and how technology has been transforming its use within the classroom, we see that 97% of elementary, 100% of secondary students, and some teachers are using some form of, of technology and communication with students throughout the day. 33% of elementary students and 40% of grades 7 and 8 and 66% of secondary students actually are encouraged to bring your own electronics every day. My uh, oldest daughter who's in grade 5, she does this right now. Every day she packs, you know, whether it's a tablet or the Chromebook, but they use them as, you know, research tools, ways to access apps that they're using in the classroom. So when we look more at how the teachers are using these communication methods and comparing elementary to secondary schools, this graph on the right is, you know, kind of a, a good depiction of what's going on in the classroom today. We're seeing online classroom within the high school is about at 91% and 85%. So this would be like your Google Meets type of uh, um, aspect. And then you have Remind app, email, website, texting, and various other forms of technology. You can you can see it's becoming very um, diverse now within the school environment. Now, March 2020 hit and that kind of changed a lot of things, especially um, around here as far as learning went. Obviously, that's when the pandemic started and children were forced out of school and having to learn virtually. In Ontario, I think it depended what school board you were with, but a lot of people and school boards weren't really prepared for dealing with all of these students to virtually learn. When my two daughters were out of school, they actually, it was just paper packages initially. There was some minimal communication on EDSBE, which is, um, uh, website or app that they can go to that the teachers um, put information and different assignments on, but there wasn't that virtual platform like Zoom or Microsoft Teams being used um, in order to actually see, physically see the teachers, see your classmates. Um, and in Ontario, we were closed down the schools for 20 weeks, which was longer than any other province or territory, and it affected over 2 million students. So like I said, when this initially happened in March of 2020, we didn't really have great ways of dealing with virtual learning. We then, you know, jump forward into September, that first kind of break we had, teachers became more familiar. They were trained better in using some of these, um, you know, platforms like Microsoft Teams or Google Meets. So this diagram at the bottom is just showing a timeline from when the schools closed and there's obviously this constant, uh, you know, in-person then disruption to school. So it was this constant in and out. So beginning in September 2020, we saw this option that was provided to students, whether you wanted to do a paper package, in-person learning or virtual learning. For those that chose virtual learning or rather, sorry, in-person learning, there was a lot of disruptions that happened throughout the year that forced them to go into some type of virtual learning. So doing all this virtual learning, what it meant for students is that they needed to have access to either a computer, a laptop, a cell phone, a tablet in order to attend these virtual classes. So what this meant then is that screen time was going to increase dramatically. Our movement, you know, was going to decrease and socialization among students decreased as well. This diagram in the bottom is showing how screen time during the COVID pandemic changed. So the red bar is showing that 63% found that 
the screen time within their household increased. And when they looked at children, they found that it increased 62%. And then when we focus in on Ontario residents, we see a 72% um, increase in a child's screen time. So virtual learning today does remain as an option to the schools uh, across Ontario, um, rather to the students. So if you want, wanted to choose virtual learning, you could have this year, you just have I think one opt in or opt out point rather than several throughout the course of the school year. School boards are required to provide students learning remotely with 300 minutes of learning opportunities. And so for students that you're already, whether you're in the classroom or you're outside the classroom, there is some type of technology being used. Obviously, it's increased more if you're learning virtually compared to being in person. But when you look at screen time that is happening outside of education and outside of school hours, Stats Canada stated that uh, youth on average spend 1.75 hours a day on some type of computer, tablet, phone. So it becomes a real concern when we were learning virtually and even, you know, when we're learning in the class, this whole idea of screen time and what it can do. So the implications on our youth is that interacting with these devices causes different postures. A lot of these devices, in fact, most of them were never intended for long duration use. They're small, so you're having to adapt um, awkward postures when using them, static grips. Often your neck is flexed down because kids are using these on a table. And if they haven't been taught, they don't necessarily prop them up so they can have neutral neck postures. Kids don't think that way. And the issue is, is that kids are in key moments of skeletal growth, right? They're still growing, they're still developing, and there is risk of permanent damage and lifelong neck pain. Looking at a few different studies just to really show the importance of why ergonomics needs to be considered among this generation that's using technology in the classroom is musculoskeletal discomfort has been associated with the poor postures that are adapted for prolonged periods of time while using laptop computers. And an alarming um, stat that came out of the study was that even though these kids were using them and it was causing them some type of discomfort, 26% of the children stated that they would carry on with using that device, even though they were in some sort of pain. There's no considerations typically given in the education environment of posture or proper workstation set up. They're just given this devices and they're to use them for whatever education means that they've been instructed to. Um, so, you know, they're, they're doing exactly like what I think of when people sit in office chairs, a lot of times people will sit in an office chair and not adjust it because they're not sure what's going, what's going to happen. The kids do the same thing. They get the, you know, they get their electronics, they set them on the table and they just begin to use them. And again, it's this whole idea that our kids are still growing, right? And uh, it could really impact them later in life. Another study at Straker at all did was he looked at tablet use and compared using tablets, desktop computers to paper task in children around five and a half years old. What they did is they measured the 3D muscle activity in the neck and shoulder. And they found that the use of tablet, you, there was a lot more muscle activity happening in the shoulders, neck, and um, just a, a lot more because of these flexed and elevated shoulders and unnatural postures that they were assuming when using in these devices. Another study showed too that neck flexion was shown to increase the load on the cervical spine. And again, this is leading to early wear and tear and degeneration. When we look more so what was happening during the pandemic as a result of using devices more, there was a study that evaluated the impact of ergonomics on children while they were studying online during the pandemic. It studied students age 10 to 17 and it was their reports of discomfort and then it looked also at their parents awareness of ergonomics so just in these two boxes here it shows that the most common discomforts um, you know stated were upper and lower back pain there was wrist pain and then headaches and dry eyes and insomnia a lot of it having to do with that constant staring at a computer screen as well as and those 
postures that were adapted while looking at these devices. And then when you looked at the parents and their awareness of ergonomics and proper workstation setup, you found that most of them had no knowledge of any type of musculoskeletal disorders, proper setup of a keyboard or a mouse. Uh, the one thing that they did know was the importance of breaks. So that was about 38%. Um, and that probably has more to do with that constant as a parent, you're always very aware of any type of screen time. But it just goes to show that there's not a lot of awareness out there when it comes to ergonomics and proper workstation setup, but uh, conversely, there's an increase in the uptake of using these devices. I'm now going to throw it over to Andrew to do the remainder of the presentation. Hello, everybody. Um, yes, Melissa did a great job there of uh, making a case uh, for the need for ergonomic intervention uh, in the classroom amongst students. Um, so what I'm going to do is go through and discuss um, some of the ergonomic hazards that we see typically in the classroom and uh, students who are working at home. Um, and then I'm going to present, uh, provide some solutions for uh, correcting these, these risks that we see. Um, <clears throat> so typically, uh, musculoskeletal disorder hazards that we would see, uh, as you can see in the photos here, um, would be awkward postures, static postures, sporish repetition, and contact stress. Uh, so in the top photo there, the girl holding the pencil with her elbows up, um, elevated above her shoulder height. Um, she's likely glancing back and forward at uh, the tablet that's in place there for instruction. Um, so she's in a very awkward static sustained posture uh, and probably can experience some contact stress on her arms. Um, looking at the second photo of the girl holding the, the tablet, um, she's glancing downward at the tablet. She has her arm extended, uh, wrist flexed, uh, and she has a uh, sustained awkward uh, pinch grip where she's holding the tablet. Um, so if she was in a class and, and holding this for an extended period of time, it would certainly be uh, a risk. And finally, the last photo, uh, the last picture here, uh, the cartoon image, uh, we can see all sorts of issues. Uh, this chair is obviously far too high uh, for the student. They don't have their feet planted on the floor. Uh, the seat pan depth is, is too deep. So their, their lower back is not supported, their upper back is not supported because they're leaning forward um, to reach the keyboard. Uh, and as well, they would be glancing upward, uh, extending at the neck to view the monitor. Okay, so uh, virtual learning, as we all know, when we were all sent home, or many of us, sorry, sent home um, to work from our homes, a lot of us went straight to our uh, dining room tables or kitchen tables. Um, and, and and for us, uh, for adults, for grown individuals, for the the, the uh, furniture and equipment that we have um, accommodates our size. But for our children, when they were sent uh, sent home to learn from home, uh, it was a much different experience for them. As we can see in in the photos here, in the bottom photo, or the bottom picture, um, this child doesn't have any support at her feet. She's unable to reach uh, the computer because it's too far away. Again, um, the seat pan depth is just too great, so there's no there's no back support. Um, so the furniture that we see in our uh, in a lot of the spaces that we would uh, typically work from home at as adults uh, doesn't necessarily accommodate the anthropometrics of uh, of children. <clears throat> and then just to compound this, um, the screen time also increased. So. Uh, this led to uh, increased eye fatigue and less movement. So children are being required to um, spend more of their day, as Melissa said, I think it was uh, five hours a day that teachers were required to provide um, in terms of lessons for students. So they're spending a great amount of time at their, at their uh, computer workstation, and they're doing this in, uh, in terrible postures, typically, with equipment that does not accommodate them. So looking at uh, the classroom learning environment, a lot of the, the risks and hazards that I just discussed uh, also come into play here. Um, maybe not to quite the same extent. The, the equipment is smaller to, to accommodate children, but often a one size fits all solution uh, just, doesn't, just doesn't seem to work. So we can see in the photo here um, with the arrows, um, the arrow pointing upwards is to indicate the height of the desk relative to the child that is seated at it. So, uh, you know, it, his, uh, his eye level is almost even with the top of his desk. Um, 
There's an arrow pointing towards the child's lower back, just showing the amount of space that she has between her lower back um, and the back of her seat, and just unable to sit back to be uh, provided with the support that she would need. Um, and then uh, if you can see the circle around the child's feet, uh, you notice that that child actually has a, a higher chair that accommodates him uh, to allow him to sit at his desk uh, to, to put his work surface at a better height. But this has resulted in uh, that child's feet not being able to make contact with the floor. Um, so the, the awkward postures and the context stress and everything that, we, that I discussed in the previous slides, um, they also come into play here. Additionally, in the classroom, we see flat desks. So the students will be looking downwards, um, particularly if they're using a, a tablet or a laptop uh, without the use of a, a riser or a, a laptop, uh, a prompt up to the laptop. Uh, they're going to be flexing at the neck to look downwards. Okay, so before I get into some of the, the solutions uh, that we can that we can use for these problems, I just wanted to, to give a cue for what proper seating posture really looks like. And uh, this is taken from the CSA standard for office ergonomics. Uh, and this is a uh, adult or a person with adult anthropometrics in the photo um, or in the picture here. Uh, but I'll just kind of go through it quickly. So we want to see an erect or upright spine. So you can see proper lumbar support from the chair um, for this individual. With the shoulders relaxed, the arms should be hanging vertically alongside the torso. Uh, and the arms bent horizontally and just being supported by the armrest. So we don't want to have uh, too much support to cause the shoulders to shrug. Um, the elbows close to the body and with the elbows at approximately a 90 degree angle, we should be able to reach our keyboard or uh, the surface that we're spending our time working at. <clears throat> our upper torso is, uh, is straight and is not uh, twisted or bent. And we should be directly in line with our monitor. Our neck is upright, so not turned or flexed. Um, some of the photos that we saw of those children, they were um, looking up or down at the surface uh, or the monitor to, to view properly. So we want to have our, our eye line of sight almost directly in line with the top of uh, the monitor. Our wrists should be straight, not, not uh, extended or, or flexed uh, while we're working at our keyboard. Um, we want our thighs to be approximately horizontal with the floor, uh, our lower legs vertical, and our feet resting firmly on the floor. So as we saw before, a lot of the children uh, were not able to make, uh, the children in those photos were not able to make uh, contact with the floor just due to the height of the seat. Um, so that's kind of a cue to keep in mind as we move forward here with some of the solutions. This is the, the posture that we want to try to achieve um, for children who are seated at a workstation. So some of the classroom solutions that we can look at, um, I mean, obviously, a lot of times teachers won't have the time to go around and make adjustments for all of the, the children in their class. But what we can do is try to keep the classroom moving um, throughout the day. So if we can have flexible seating arrangements, that can promote uh, and help students focus. Um, so things like using stools or sitting on the ground, having different workstations that are going to keep the students moving um, throughout the day and not requiring a sustained posture uh, that we see um, sitting forward, uh, facing the front of the room traditionally. Um, so st studies support uh, that a standing desk uh, for students are beneficial for academic achievement, as well as for combating childhood obesity by increasing energy expenditure. Um, so again, just the idea of being keeping children moving throughout the day helps them focus um, and, and uh, increases energy expenditure. So chair solutions for virtual learning. So, you know, when the, ch when the child's uh, been sent to work from home and they've, uh, been, they've kind of decided they're going to work from the uh, dining room table, as we can see in the image on this slide. Um, so this particular child has been set up um, quite well to work in this station. You can see that they found a, a stool uh, to allow their feet to be planted firmly. Um, and they've got a, either a, a booster or a, a cushion pillow of some sort that has allowed them to be the proper height uh, for their work surface. Um, so we can use things like pillows, stack towels uh, to raise the body. Um, and we, I mean, we don't have to have a stool, you can use a box, a crate, anything like that that's going to uh, provide some support for, for the feet. 
And then uh, additionally, underneath of the, the laptop there, the, the student has some, uh, some books that they placed uh, to raise the level of the, the laptop so that their line of sight is uh, directly in line with the top of the laptop. When we think about screen position, um, we want to position the screen approximately an arm's length away. Um, so reaching forward when you're seated with your back firmly against the, the back of your desk, or sorry, back, back of your chair, um, you should be able to just, just reach the, your monitor, uh, just, your, just reach your screen. So this is obviously different when uh, children are using smaller devices, such as a phone, which uh, should be avoided. Um, or a, a tablet. Um, so if it's a smaller font, it may need to be positioned slightly closer. Um, our line of sight, as I mentioned before, should be directly in line with the top of uh, the screen, and the positioning should allow for neutral neck postures again. So we don't want to have any extension looking upwards or flexion looking downwards uh, to view the screen appropriately. <laughs> so some uh, solutions for, for adjusting the monitor. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, you can see in the, the picture on the right here, the student has used uh, three um, looks like packs of paper to raise the monitor to have the monitor be um, appropriately in line with their line of sight. Uh, it's also extremely important uh, to use, as you can see in the, the, the image, um, the student has a, a mouse and a keyboard. Um, so without the use of the mouse and keyboard, they would be reaching forward uh, extending their arms to use their, um, to type or to use the mouse. And uh, this, it really wouldn't allow them to ever achieve po proper posture because they would either be reaching um, or they would be lowering their laptop to have it on the work surface. Uh, and that would result in them looking down. Um, so if we're using tablet, uh, tablet stands should be used. used. Uh, and I know that uh, Bluetooth um, keyboards and Bluetooth uh, mites or mouses um, can be used as well uh, to avoid having to, to reach forward to constantly touch the screens on the tablets. Okay, with regard to um, eye fatigue, uh, because if we are viewing our monitors for extended periods of time, it can lead to computer vision syndrome, or digital eye strain, um, it can lead to dry eyes, headaches, uh, eye sensitivity and strain. So a good rule of thumb to keep in mind is um, every 20 minutes, uh, look at something that's 20 feet away for 20 seconds. So if you have a window nearby, uh, it's a great idea to, to glance out the window and you know watch the birds for 20 seconds. Um, we're able to adjust the brightness of our monitors. So keep in mind that we don't want our uh, the brightness of our screens to be too bright uh, or, or too dim. Uh, we want it to adjust the brightness appropriately to accommodate um, uh, Glare and uh, the screen uh, position and lighting uh, should be, uh, sorry, it should not be placed directly below any lights. Um, and we should position our workstations perpendicularly, perpendicularly to windows, uh, just again to avoid glare. Um, so again, as I mentioned with the, the classroom solutions, at least every uh, every 10 minutes, uh, it's, it's just super important to move. So at least every 10 minutes, we want to take a short 10 to 20 second break, um, take our hands off the keyboards and move. So if you if you have uh, children at home or students at home or students in the classroom even, it's a great idea to just every 10 minutes encourage your uh, students to take a short 10, 20 second break uh, and just to do some simple stretches just to look away from the monitor. And then every 30 to 60 minutes, we should take a brief, um, a brief break and stand up and walk around. Um, stretch this, this little cartoon of the cats here. Uh, it's a great example of um, some very simple stretches that can be done right next to your uh, computer workstation. Uh, and uh, it doesn't have to be anything uh, significant. So just like a two minute break, just enough to, to get up. Um, you know, another, another great thing is if you get up to go to the washroom, uh, that's also a great time just to take a second and do some stretches. Uh, and then again, if students have the option to uh, stand while watching lectures, or if they're if they're uh, in some sort of lesson that doesn't require uh, them to be interactive, using the mouse or keyboard, um, they could stand, take a step back from their monitor, 
and uh, and really have a, a, a posture break that way. So the key takeaways here uh, is that uh, time spent completing studies should not hurt. So uh, we want to educate our children and students about the ergonomic hazards that exist in their learning environment, really because education is key. And the more that we can teach uh, children and students about ergonomic hazards that exist, um, we can help them be aware of them moving forward so they can avoid them in the future. Um, and again, we can work with our students or children uh, to develop solutions. You know, the kids might be aware of something that you have laying around the house uh, that could be a really good prop that could help them get into a more neutral posture. Um, so that's all that we have today. I've included our uh, email addresses for both Melissa and I if you have any questions and you wanted to reach out. Uh, we'd be happy to provide any support that you may need. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Melissa and Andrew. Um, you know, while it's still fresh in everybody's mind, um, we might kind of um, maybe spend some minutes now. If anybody has any questions of Melissa and Andrew, um, you know, ergonomics related for, you know, for children, we, we ask, you know, children to stay at home when, you know, the um, community transmission is high, but we're also introducing hazards there with, with possible, possibly poor ergonomics in, in houses and homes. So, I just, um, is there anything that um, Melissa and Andrew have presented that, um, you know, has inspired somebody to ask a question or just raise something that they might want to share with the group here? Don't be shy, show yourself if you want to ask a question. No, okay. Um, well, I just want to thank you both again for uh, sharing your, your knowledge and it's such an important, um, it's such an important area for, for sure. Did um, you see a question there, is, there Kevin? You, yeah, Sorry. I saw that come through yeah. too, Vani. Um, maybe we just put that to them. It's got here any comment on headaches for children? I think it says headsets. Um, oh, headsets. Sorry, yeah. I thought it was a headache. Oh. Headsets for children. Yeah, headsets um, for children. Yeah, and um, I mean, really, it's all about uh, comfort. I mean, we 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 say to wear headsets, you know, when we're in different types of meetings as opposed to having your phone and shoulder and typing. So for them to um, interacting, I know when my girls are at home, sometimes they wore them, sometimes they didn't, sometimes they felt like there was too much pressure on their ears, they wanted to take a break. So maybe having the option that they can and they can't, uh, you know, kind of go back and forth, but they're not typically using headsets the way that we would recommend them in an office environment. Typically in an office environment, we're recommending them because they have a lot of telephone usage and we want to maintain neutral neck postures. Um, so they can be used, um, especially if hearing is an issue too. You don't want to have to, you know, them be sitting even closer to something in order to be able to get that audio. So in those cases, you may want to have a headset, but um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Melissa. Actually, um, um, Melissa, was, uh, was my question was more around noise limiting in terms of kids, or if you knew if there were any products meant for children that fit children's heads, I guess, but also that have sound limiting so that um, in order to prevent noise induced hearing loss in the future. Yeah, so both of my girls actually wore those uh, Beats. Has everyone heard of Beats? So they're, they're noise canceling ones as well, um, which was great too, because then you're not having to increase the volume so much to try to like get the outside, or sorry, rather background noise out. So they wore those um, and they were also kind of padded around the ears as well. So yeah, no good point Val too. So wearing something that's noise canceling is going to eliminate all that background noise from them too and then they don't have to listen to something on stun right okay um so i might just sort of like just make a comment here just for everybody in line um okay is kind of a pretty unique uh, organization because okay do have um, dedicated ergonomists and it's a real specialized skill set so um it's kind of the luxury that we have working for okay and you know i'm i'm sure that melissa and andrew and others, other ergonomists in OCA would be more than happy to answer any questions if you want to follow up. But we'll we'll go to the Q and A at the end, um, and then we we'll ha might have a bit more time to sort of to to, to talk about this. So so thanks, guys.